Good afternoon, everyone that's joining in to our session. And I'm just going to firstly introduce you to our host for this afternoon, Hester Hickey. Um, we're going to be looking at unpacking the public inspections report. And Hester's going to give you a very brief overview of what the intention uh, of uh, the session is for. And she will then introduce you to each of our esteemed panelists that we have on this afternoon. I will be here on the background. You can post any technical issues you have on the chat group and I will help you out. Otherwise, I'll see you all again later on um, during the Q&A. So Hester, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks so much, Vicky. Good afternoon, everybody. And on behalf of the IOD and the Audit Committee Forum, I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar today. Uh, we're trying something a bit different where we have four panelists that represent different perspectives in relation to the public inspections report. The Audit Committee's been grappling, or I think Audit Committees generally have been grappling with what exactly they need to do to ensure audit quality. Uh, and in particular, the aspects around the urban reports on the, um, uh, that, that are made on the external audit firms. So I welcome our panel, which is made up of the Urba Chief Executive Officer, welcome Emre, uh, the three members of the Audit Committee for, Forum, namely the Head of Audit for KPMG in South Africa, Devon, uh, the Executive of Audit and Assurance at SICU, Saika, sorry, uh, Tanda Kushle, and Independent Ned and Audit Committee Chair of various JSE companies, Tasneem Abdul Samad. One objective of the forum is to raise issues that audit committees are grappling with and then put forward guidelines to try and assist people to deal with the issues that aren't easy to resolve. It's been on our agenda for a while, and there are actually quite a lot of issues raised where people are uncertain as to how should we deal with this or that. So that's why we've got the various people here so that we've got all the perspectives and we can then perhaps look at what is needed by audit committee members out there. So as there is some confusion, let's listen to the views of the panel on how we should deal with the public inspection reports. We'll start with a question that says, what is every stakeholder's understanding of their respective roles and responsibilities in the process? We're going to start with you, Imre. Could you give us an oversight as to what, 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 what are the key issues from your side? Good afternoon, Hester, and to my fellow uh, Panelists, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to address um, the members today. Hester, I'm going to start off by saying, starting off to say that the mandate of the ERBA is quite limited. We don't regulate audit committees or companies. Our our mandate is limited to regulate auditors that are registered with us. And there's currently about 3,650 registered auditors on our, on our register. So um, our mandate is really confined to setting education, auditing and ethics standards for auditors to license them at the back of that and to monitor their compliance and where necessary, uh, in some instances, there would also be disciplinary uh, processes. But more relevant to today, and I think, um, my intention is really if, if, if I can share some information and insights from what the regulator expects, uh, knowing that we don't have any, any mandate or any authority over audit committees, but to, to, to just share that, I, I think it would go a long way in, in building a relationship going forward. So more relevant to today, um, as the regulator and the auditors that we regulate, we are representing a just a part of or a smaller group of the financial reporting and governance ecosystem. We just some of the role players. So you, 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 everybody knows you have the preparers in the companies, you have those charged with governance, the boards, and then the audit committees. Uh, you have other service providers or internal audit, forensic, et cetera. Then you have the auditors coming in at the end and, uh, and the regulators that oversee the work of the auditors. Uh, well, I'm speak, I can speak for the audit regulator. 
And, uh, but we, as an audit regulator, we recognize the audit committee's role in the ecosystem to protect investors. I think we, we recognize that we all want the same thing. However, unfortunately, a few high profile corporate failures um, prompted us as a regulator to do more and to respond to the environment. And investors and the public are upset that auditors fail to report uh, on the failures and, and that in itself broke the confidence and trust in auditors. And that is where the regulator, you know, the expectation is quite high on the regulator, not just in South Africa, but globally to do more. And I think that is where, you know, we need to find ways as regulators to, to stimulate the, the, the other stakeholders in the system. So we all, you should also be aware that global standard setters and regulators then responded uh, and beefed up their own processes uh, to avoid further failures. Uh, and similarly, National Treasury last year strengthened the IRBA's independence and our enforcement powers uh, through our um, Auditing Profession Amendment Act, which came into power in April last year. Parliament also approved our new five-year strategy last year in terms of focusing on restoring confidence uh, by working together with relevant stakeholders. And audit committees are one of those key stakeholders that we identified as a regulator to work with and to, to, to co collaborate and cooperate with uh, to support a, a common objective. We recognize that even if we don't have the mandate in the name of protecting the public interest, we must find ways to work together uh, to ensure high quality um, financial reporting and high quality audits and to ensure that there's integrity at every step of financial reporting. Um, audit committees are really a, a, a force multiplier of audit quality and um, from a re regulatory perspective because audit committees are even closer to the auditors um, than the regulator. They're at the cold face of appointing the right auditor, considering competency, experience, and capacity, and to help ensure independence by, for example, approving or not approving non-audit services to the same audit client. So there's, a, there's, there's definitely an opportunity for a mutual benefit for both the regulator and audit committees to work together to promote our audit quality and ethics. And ultimately, I think the goal is to lower the risk in the system and reduce the, the probability of unreported corporate failures. Urba sees itself in that regard as an enabler of audit committees by providing relevant information on firms, on the, on the firm's quality and the way they manage their quality and by, um, for example, issuing comparable um, audit quality indicators, uh, we believe that audit committees can use these um, mechanisms or this information when engaging their auditors, uh, and that would enable the constructive discussions and, and, and uh, raise issues around quality at that point when the audit firm is appointed or reappointed. For example, audit committees and firms might be interested in the deficiency themes that are highlighted in our latest public inspections report, which is due to be issued uh, very soon. For example, 40% of our inspection findings at firm level relate to independence issues, which uh, includes, for example, pro providing prohibited services to the audit client. And that's just one example where audit committees can play a, a proactive role in addressing such services with the incumbent auditor. Most of the other deficiencies we, we reported on in the last year, about 40% are on engagement performance. Uh, and uh, in particular, what, uh, what we saw in the last year was an uptick in, uh, in the effectiveness of engagement quality reviews. Uh, so those are things that you know, we report to the firms and we uh, obtain um, commitments from the firms that those, those issues will be addressed. Uh, the majority of our latest inspection findings uh, or, uh, in our inspection report that we're busy compiling highlights areas of deficiencies. For example, 20% of our findings at the engagement file level relate to financial statement um, preparation and disclosure. 
which is quite a high percentage. Um, it means that when we look at a set of financials, we pick up things that the auditors did not pick up through the audit. So those are just a few examples, Esther, um, but really just to, just to reiterate that the intention for us as a regulator is firstly for firms to, to promptly address, well, firstly for them to manage their quality um, in terms of their quality management systems um, and to promptly, if there's any deficiencies identified either through their own internal processes um, or through the review of, of the regulator, if there are themes that come up, um, that they address those themes um, promptly, and to to make sure that you know the issues don't recur on on, on other audits, and also at the same time um, provide assurance to the audit committees that the issues that were reported to the firm will not happen on their clients' audit. I think that is really there is the it's the crux of the value is there that. You know, there can be an agreement between the auditor and the and the audit committee on areas of the of of of, of improvement that it is monitored and sort of discussed and front of mind on that particular audit, so that once the audit opinion is issued, the audit committee and the firm um, can can really uh, say uh, that they've addressed the issues and that previously reported issues have not occurred again on on that audit. So Esther, I'll stop there. Um, that's really at a high level. I think the intention and the objectives of the regulator and uh, from a regulatory a regulatory perspective. Thanks, Imran. The two things that, that I take out of that is the one is that we're all part of the ecosystem. And the second, of course, is that everybody used to ask who audits the auditors and you do. And it's never it's never an easy relationship, but it should be one that ensures the ultimate goal of uh, things are done better in the long term. Devin, I'm going to ask you this, uh, your, your perspective and give you some time to tell us where you, where you guys are coming from, the auditors. Thanks, Hester. Yeah, um, and I'm going to pick up on a number of themes that Imre has already started, and thank you for those opening comments, Imre. So certainly as a member of the audit profession, as the head of audit um, of, of one of the big four audit firms, um, it's a really interesting question, Hester, to say, you know, well, what is our perspective on this public uh, inspections report? And just for the members today, I'd, I'd like to just start maybe a couple of steps behind, further back than what Imre did, um, to make a couple of what might seem like pretty obvious things, but they're worth exploring and just bearing in our, in, in, you know, uppermost in our mind. I think first, let's start by recognizing that the auditor's job is one to serve the public interest. Now that might sound trite, and I'm quite sure that every student who's ever you know, qualified as a chartered accountant or auditor would tell you that that was in the document somewhere. Although I was horrified um, after all the challenges of the profession in 2017 to realize that when I raised this um, across the profession, as part of our first conversations about rebuilding trust in the profession, I was horrified how few people actually knew where and that it was enshrined that our job is to serve the public interest, Hester. So I'm going to start there. I'm going to get a little more philo philosophical on that, Hester, because I'm going to start quoting some Plato and Aristotle quite soon. But uh, um, yeah, yeah, there you go, Hester. I didn't hear you, but I, lip, I lip read it, so I think it was okay. And, you know, when I say we serve the public interest, honestly, I'd like to suggest that even if it was not enshrined in our own codes of ethics, and in fact, in the various regulations that we abide by, the mere fact that we are something called a profession, and some of you will have heard me say this before, the definition of a profession goes back to the ancient Greeks, when they realized the profession was what you gave to certain people, a privilege you gave to certain people to do a otherwise dangerous task that the public needed to have some trust in, namely cut off my arm, pull out my tooth, build me something that's gonna cross a river um, and ultimately um, be an auditor, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. The concept of a profession is that it is a dangerous job that the public needs done, that they wish to imbue the trust in a selected few folk to do this. Um, 
And I found it quite interesting that we as the audit profession need to remind ourselves about that. So if we exist to serve indeed not our client who appoints us or in or through the audit committee, ultimately, because I think the audit committee picks up the same responsibility, our job is to protect the public interest. The mere recognition of that is a pretty good place to start. Um, Throughout the years, Imre spoke about some of the latest corporate collapses, et cetera. The reality was the question you just asked, Chair, became the relevant one. So who audits the auditors? And how sad is it that when you reach a trust that a profession which in which the public trusts you, was they were all, and many of them are still highly self-regulated. But in our case, the work we do is so important and impacts so many people, think pensioners, think you know, shares invested in companies. The impact of the work we do is often more widespread, more hard felt than if a doctor gets something wrong. And while we don't deal with life threatening, you know, the reality is we impact people's lives beyond anything we could imagine. And certainly our chairman, Professor Wiseman and Kuklu always says, therefore, recognize the nobility of our profession, just in terms of the extent of the blast radius that, that can be impacted if we don't do our work properly. So if our job is to protect the public interest, we reached a point where the world felt you can't just rely on the fact that the auditors, this concept, trust me, trust me, I'm an auditor, it'll be fine. Mm. And our chairman, when we brought our new chairman is, and, in as one of the few, and I think still truly independent non-execs to try and oversee an audit firm, which is an interesting governance thought in itself, he starts with things like tone and culture and purpose, because, you know, when we're away ticking and bashing some extremely complex aspect of some bank somewhere, it is important we bear in mind our role. The fact that this moved to the, the point that the industry, the profession needed to be regulated is an old thing. It's a worldwide thing. But even in South Africa, remind ourselves, it's not too many decades ago when we didn't have an independent regulator. We had a club. So when we talk about the role of this public inspections report, let's recognize that this is a body. It's from a regulator whose job it is to check whether the auditors are doing their job properly. Therefore, when you say, what is the auditor's perspective on this? And I can tell you, I would imagine over the years, Imre, I'm sure you saw it. Um, I would think the audit profession's um, response to reaction to public inspection reports has not always been hugely positive, Hester. I think you kind of were very generous by suggesting maybe it's a difficult relationship from time to time. Yeah. The reality is I think it was downright negative at various points in time and unconstructive, um, if that's the right word. Um, and it's only by going back to your purpose when you recognize my job is to serve the public interest. The world and indeed our statutes created a regulator to check that I'm doing my work correctly. The way they do that is by inspecting a number of things. They inspect actual audit engagements and they expect, Imre referred to it, the processes and controls we have in place to manage quality. Those are two quite different things. So the first thing I'd remind your members, Hester, there are two types of reports you get from the regulator. One, when they, it, they check an audit file for whether there is adequate evidence on that file to support the opinion we got to. And the other is a much broader piece of work where they, Imre, I've said this to you in a boardroom, where it felt like every single process in the firm, from hire to fire, from marketing to every process in the firm is reviewed in a fair amount of detail because every part of those processes exist in order to ultimately produce an audit quality product. So two types of reports that are produced and Imre referred to those. I think the next step is for the auditors to recognize, and as we do, that our regulator is fully engaged with all of the global regulators. And you heard Imre talk about the pressure on regulators to step up and therefore our regulator stepped up. So what is asked of us and the depth of to which it's investigated has gone up. And that's gone up because the public felt let down to be perfectly honest. This shouldn't surprise us as members of the profession. And I, I'd like to applaud Imre for recognizing, I'm not sure it's always the auditor's fault, but at the end of the day, the public does look to us. And so recognizing that we've got a regulator who's been given a job, 
who coordinates globally to ensure they follow the same tough best practices are followed anywhere else in the world. And that's applied to the firm and that has been a step up, you've heard that. For me, that significant increase has been really interesting because what comes out of it is a great many, many findings. And I think audit committees will have ex experienced the many hundred page reports that are coming out now. And I think it's really important what auditors do with those reports, either their own report or indeed the general profession wide report where, where Imre and his team try to summarize the themes across all the firms. And I think all of those things are things that auditors should spend more time talking to audit committees about to say what happened, why did this happen, could it happen on your audit, what have we done to ensure it doesn't happen again and by doing that, which has always been the regulators ask of audit committees, the audit committee is pulled into this value cycle in a much more direct way to say guys you're the guys at the coalface that have the power through selection and deselection of auditors to say, am I comfortable this auditor is doing what they ought to do? What went wrong on other files? And things always go wrong somewhere on when you do 15, 20,000 audits in a year in one firm. Um, something could go wrong, might go wrong, is likely to go wrong in some place. It's, that shouldn't surprise anyone. You know, I think it's going to be a long time until we get inspection reports that say, hey, nothing to report here on any aspect of the firm or files. Um, but it's that constant journey towards how do you keep getting this better and better and better. And the last point I'd add, Hester, is maybe ultimately the way what's important for us as auditors is how we respond to this. And I've lived through the evolutions of that. You can respond by going, this is, you know, really just all sorts of detail, really doesn't impact my opinion at all on some client. And that we know is the narrative that existed for decades. My audit opinion is okay. What I think we need to respect more now is the fact that every aspect of what we do and how we do it, in fact, every thought we have, everything we think is required to be documented so it can be inspected later by somebody who knows very little about the client. And they have to be able to come up with the same view we did. And I'd like all the audit committee members just to reflect on that. The, what, er, what Erba is checking is indeed so detailed that what, which is a good thing, is that they're saying, unless when I thought about some aspect of why I could live with some issue or not on an audit, if I didn't document adequately so that an independent party who has never been to the client can mm -hmm. see that my conclusion was right, that is regarded as a poor quality piece of work. So maybe that I'd, I'd, I'd end on that point, Hester, and we can explore it later, is the definition of audit quality and how it's being measured. It has to be the auditors can't simply say, my opinion's fine, the rest is whatever, because we, our opinion says we issue that opinion in compliance with all international auditing standards and appropriate local laws and regulations. There are many auditing standards. They expect a great deal. And therefore, yes. what Imre does is check it all. And that's the definition of quality, not just, you know, is my opinion sort of in the right vicinity? Yeah. Yeah, is there no fraud? Because yeah. that, that that should be the ultimate goal, not, not the continuous goal. So as you were talking, Devin, it made me think, audit committees, we're in the same position. There is more and more regulation and things that we need to do. But at the end of the day, we can't just do it with integrity. We have to, at a later date, be able to demonstrate that we did it. And the whole world's moving in that direction. So I'm going to move to you, Tasneem, just to give, you've had a lot of experience and on the committee, we've discussed a lot of the issues along the way. So I'm going to ask you to give us your perspective, please. Thanks, Hester, and good afternoon to you and the panelists and everyone attending. And I just want to say it's really wonderful to have Imre in this forum to engage with us. I think this is the first time that we're engaging with Imre in this, in this forum. I also want to just take us back a little, if, if you just indulge me, but I promise you, I won't be quoting any Greek philosophy along the way, because I'm just a lowly audit committee chair. 
Um, but just, you know, um, in reflecting on what our roles and responsibilities over the inspection reports, Hester, I reflected on what is our audit committee's mandate over financial statement integrity. And it actually talks to the points that Imre and Devon raised. And if I think about our mandate of a financial statement integrity, it is influenced by audit quality, which is informed by audit firm and audit designated audit partner suitability. So then, you know, if I then look back, so what are the, the governance mechanisms um, that would govern these, these uh, this would be internally, it would be, for example, the board MOI, the audit committee charter and our terms of reference. And then externally, it's actually is a myriad of uh, regulations and codes in some instances. So of course we know we've got the King 4 code, which will guide our mandate over financial statement integrity. We have, as you know, the Companies Act section 94, which also guides um, our, our mandate mandate over, over financial statement integrity. And then more to the point, we have the JSC listings requirements, section 3.84 um, on auditor suitability and section 3.86 of the JSC listings requirements of um, auditor accreditation. Now, I specifically raised this, call it the backdrop or the context, because against this backdrop of assessing auditor suitability to assess quality to support financial statement integrity, one important mechanism that allows the audit committee to make this view is the inspection reports that we receive from Erba. And I deliberately use the word one important mechanism, and I'll try and clarify that just now. But in receiving these full reports, and it's to Devon's point, full, even if they are 100 odd pages, it is our uh, responsibility as an audit committee to ensure that we objectively consider and interrogate this information in its fullness. And I think the important point I just want to, to leave, um, and then we can hopefully pick it up a bit later, is that it's not read and not considered and not interrogated in isolation. It is one of a few other points of reference. And, and I just perhaps wanted to give some clarity. What are these other points of reference? It's the internal quality assurance reviews, as was mentioned, that we would be looking at to correlate the information that we receive from the um, urban reports. It's management's assessment of the firm, as in your in, 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 the, in the company that you're in, what is the management's view and assessment of the firm and the audit partner? What is our experience of the firm and the audit partner as an audit committee experience? And what is the audit quality indicators that have been presented in the transparency reports from the firms? And an additional point is to Emre's issue, what is the audit quality indicators that have been produced by the ERBA to have a, to have a full view on, on, I guess, thematic audit quality issues in, overall in the, in, the, in, the, in the profession. So all of these inputs help form a, a view that the, audit quality, that the audit committee then can give on overall auditor suitability and, and audit firm suitability. So I just thought I'll just give that high level view of where we believe, I believe our role and responsibilities is with regards to these urban inspection report. But I am hoping that you can flesh that conversation out a little bit further later. Thanks, Tasneem. Yes, it's it's it, it, you're doing exactly what Devon did, and I think that was great. You went back to basics and says, said, why are we doing this? And sometimes we do lose sight of that. So now I'm going to give you last but not least, uh, Tanda Kushle, uh, your your um, opportunity to to give us a view of your roles and responsibilities. Thank you very much, Hester. Um, good afternoon to my fellow panelists, and good afternoon to all the members that are currently online. Um, I obviously come from the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. Um, IMRE regulates us. Um, you've got um, the likes of Devon, um, who represents the assurance constituency, who, you know, uh, who, who are our members. Um, we've got audit committee members also um, being SICA members. So we kind of bring everyone together in a way. Uh, but I think it's important that I kind of um, sound like a stat record and kind of mention what uh, I think what um, Imre mentioned initially, um, just around the importance of the auditing profession um, when it comes to maintaining trust in the capital markets and also providing credibility in the in the financial reporting system or process rather. I think it's a, it's a role that is often underplayed, um, that often comes up only when something wrong happens and everyone starts screaming, you know, where were the auditors? 
Um, but I think it needs to be part of our education um, to, to make sure that we, you know, we, we instill, particularly in those young members coming through um, in the profession, um, the role um, that the auditing profession plays in creating stability in, in our capital market. Um, but yeah, so auditors, I mean, obviously do not play this, this role on their own. Um, they operate within a financial reporting ecosystem. Um, we've got preparers such as your CFOs, we've got governance structures, um, your boards, your audit committees, and other assurance providers such as internal audit um, to, mention, um, to mention some. And I think what's important is that when an audit engagement is completed, um, it's not just the auditor, right, who's been involved. All of those role players have some kind of impact on the level of audit quality that is achieved in a particular um, audit engagement. So I think it's quite important that we kind of emphasize that role um, um, the, or the role of the wider financial reporting ecosystem. So ultimately, I think if the objectives of all of those role players, including the inspectors, um, to just to make sure that um, um, everyone is kind of aligned um, with that focus um, of, 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 of conducting high quality audits, and I think ultimately that will kind of bring credibility, like I said, to um, um, our, our financial reporting um, processes. And that's, Thanks. I think that. No, finish off. All right, cool. And I think that's why I think from our side, as Saika, we're quite appreciative of a platform like this because, um, you know, we're able to bring all of those role players in this discussion and get um, that wide array of, of, of views. Um, so I think the, the, the one thing that I'll touch on is just the importance of the quality uh, of, of the quality management um, processes within firms. And I think I think it was Imro indicated that you know a strong system of quality management is critical um, in improved um, and sustained audit quality. And we're seeing that the report that that, that does come out, a big part of it does really place a lot of focus on um, on on quality management. So. I think that is quite important. And that being said, I think the one question that uh, probably audit committees should be asking at this point in time with the new quality management standards coming into effect in December this year is, you know, what, what have the firms done um, to, um, to, 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 I guess, to, to become ready um, to implement the new systems of quality management? Because I mm -hmm. think that has kind of provided uh, probably an opportunity to introspect and reflect um, on how, um, you know, tone at the top, tone at the top, um, on, on the culture of the firm, on some of the ethics and independence processes. Um, so I think it's quite important that, I guess, probably as audit committees, um, you begin to ask those questions just around what have you done um, to, to implement the new quality management standards. And I think later on in my presentation, I'll kind of get um, to what SICA has done in terms of the guidance that we have provided and how we've worked with the profession um, as a whole to, to provide support in terms of the implementation of those quality management standards. But let, me, let me pause there, Hester, and then, um, yeah. That's lovely, thank, thank, you. thank you for that. Uh, and you said something very important. You said that the question is being asked, where were the auditors? However, the question is now being asked, where was Erba? Where were the audit committee members? Where was SICA? Where was internal audit? So it's not that the auditors are, are alone in this. Everybody has to demonstrate that the quality is appropriate. And, and, and we're all under the same risk of when things go wrong. All right, Devin, I'm going to come back to you and ask, how should external auditors be addressing their own and the profession um, uh, mm. inspection reports, and, and and are they taken seriously? Yeah, it's a really important question, Hester. And again, I think this is something that has probably changed significantly over the last, let's call it, five years. Um, so two things have changed. As, as I said, these reports have become bigger and more detailed, and I'm hoping that um, what all audit committees will see is that audit committees are taking them more seriously. So I'm hoping those are the trends that are visible. Um, I, I, how should we be addressing it? I think Tasneem has mentioned a couple of thoughts on this one. For starters, we should be addressing it in full. 
So I can, I certainly can tell from uh, the experiences I have of having to, to go and have conversations with audit committees about KPMG audit quality finding reports from the, uh, from the regulator. Um, different audit committees handle it differently, want different levels of input, want different levels of detail. Yet uh, Tasnima has neatly reminded all of us that the obligation on auditors and indeed the obligation on audit committees through the JSC listing requirements, so certainly for JSC listed entities, um, is that we have to give you the full report, warts and all, and you are required to consume the full report, warts and all. Um, and I think that's not necessarily fully embedded either by auditors or by audit committees yet. I think that's that's where it's so that's the first obligation. We need to get this entire report to you. Uh, the JSC is also very clear. You have very little time. We need to get this to you within ten days of these reports being published. So we need to get it to you. But far more importantly, and this I have seen um, a, a huge improvement on, is it falls on the audit committee chair often rather than the full audit committee to be the person who consumes this entire report. And I, again, in my in the various audit committees I engage, that ranges from audit committees who have read every single word of those reports and can interrogate me on any part of that report to others who are really just saying, okay, what are the big themes here? And I believe neither is wrong. You, it, it depends on how the auditor responds to it. So I think what I, aside from the fullness of what we give you, I think what's really important, and I've heard the regulator ask audit committees time and time again to say, what does he want you to do when we're doing this with you? The first thing he says is, please look at the tone with which we're handling this matter. Um, I can tell you, I've been in audit committees where the audit committee chair has been very clear on, you know, if we have tried to defend something which they didn't necessarily agree with. They've kind of gone, we're not really, are you? we want you to know what you're going to do about it. We're not questioning whether the regulator was right or wrong. You tell me what you're doing about it. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing greater pushback, which is great. And I'm hoping that generally auditors are just being very open and honest and transparent around it. So question one, the fullness of it. Question two, have a conversation because just having the report is just not enough. I do think auditors want to provide context. I think we have to worry if the audit context starts by saying, okay, there are these 600 findings, or I'm exaggerating for effect, but really none of them are hugely important. I think that's wrong because as I said, you need every part of the quality management process to be working in order to actually issue your audit opinion. Even if those financials are not wrong and there's nothing wrong at all. If you didn't comply with auditing standards, you haven't met the audit quality measure, um, which is a high bar. So my sense is they are taken more seriously, Hester, than they ever were before. I am pretty sure I, I, I do. I'm privileged enough to do a huge amount of joint audits with at least all of the other big firms mm -hmm. and some of the medium firms. And I can see that that seriousness with which it's taken is generally the trend that I can see, which is good. And I'm seeing audit committees um, you know, accepting less about the fact that, well, you know, this is not a big deal. I'm seeing audit committees going, no, no, we don't think it's our job to determine if it's a big deal or not. Your regulator has said it's an issue. Therefore, we want to know what you as the firm are doing about this. Um, and so a lot falls on the audit committee in a conversation to say that what we're doing about it is not a short conversation, Hester. Um, so, you, you know, there's quite a lot to unpack in the what are you doing about this stuff? Um, and I'm seeing audit committees at the top level investing multiples the amount of time that they ever would have in the past just to do some justice to this process. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that will follow a normal curve. We'll have some audit committees where this is literally just a 10 minute thing in a standard audit committee. At the, at, at, the, at the really top end of this, um, we're seeing separate meetings being set up with audit committees with sufficient time, often hours, to explore the matters. Now, I don't know what, that there's a right or wrong in that, but that's what the audit committee needs to look at to say, I need to understand if this audit firm is taking it seriously, the nature of the issues. I need to understand what they're doing about it and opine whether I'm happy with that. And by the way, I have seen... Um, Imre, this might make your heart pleased. 
I've seen audit committees say to auditors, we are not satisfied that you are doing enough to address it. We want you to go back and come back to us again and tell us you know, what you have done about it, because we don't think you're taking it seriously enough. So I think the ecosystem at the, at the really top end is, is actually doing exactly what the regulator is hoping, which is that we all keep nudging towards some ideal perfection, although we know the definition of perfection is going to keep growing and get more complex. We keep moving in that direction. And for me, it comes down to tone and culture, Hester, of we accept it. We don't miss it, by the, maybe two, two other points, Hester. I've heard this forum ask about, but the auditors don't seem to agree with the regulator. I think that's an important point to explore at audit committee level. I don't think, um, Imre will know this, that we will necessarily agree on every point the regulator comes to a conclusion on. And I don't think that's a bad thing either. Because I think an audit committee can explore why do you disagree with the regulator? Um, you can have that conversation. And I don't think the regulator minds that, to be honest. They're just wanting to say, you know, and, and audit committee is a separate entity who will look at it. And as I say, for the proof of the pudding for me has been when an audit committee says, I hear you, um, but we don't agree with you. We want you to go do something else. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, we, we recently had a conversation with a JSC um, lead regulator in a, in a CFO forum. And again, we're talking about proactive inspection reports and so on from their side. So in parallel, similar to our regulator, the concept is, we want to nudge financial reporting in the right direction. And if we can do that by raising issues or tell you in advance or tell you at the end, we want a nudging of continuous improvement. And I think that's exactly what we ought to be trying to achieve. The only word I would add to that, constantly nudging. Yes, it, it is very it's, constant. It's, it's a process and it has to continue. <laughs> yeah. um, very, and very the, very the two things that I get out of what you're saying is, the one, the auditors are becoming less of, less defensive and accepting that this is going to happen, we need to deal with it. And there's a good outcome for everybody if we deal with it appropriately. And the other is that audit committees are saying, am I doing enough? Um, and, and I think that's why we're putting it out there. Are we doing enough? So I'm going to ask um, uh, Tanda Kushle again, what guidance and support is SICA putting in place to help audit committee members? Thank you, Hester. Um, so we've got a number of technical documents um, that we've got, because um, obviously we meet with the IRBA inspections team on a quarterly basis, where we get to understand some of the themes that, are, that they're picking up in the inspections that they, are, that, that they are conducting. And based on those discussions, you know, we'll go back to our technical committees within SICA, um, share some of those findings, um, get different perspectives um, from both, I guess, from, in, in, in most instances, from the firms. Um, so we've got a lot of the firms um, represented in our structures, just in terms of where, I guess, the differences are, are coming up. Because sometimes you find that, you know, firms have very specific, strong views on certain elements. Um, and, you know, there's always that tension where we kind of, um, uh, where we interacting with both the regulator and the firms to get to a common to get to a common ground. And what we've got, we've got technical documents. So we've got a frequently asked questions document that really highlights some of the key um, or some of the common inspections findings that have been picked up, I think probably dating to about 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. And with those, with those, I guess with those problem statements, we then use the standards to kind of get to um, some so some kind of solutions to to address those problems. Um, that that document um, is not just drafted by SICA alone. We get input from the RBA inspections team as well, um, just to make sure that we're not completely missing the point on on, on certain issues. And um, so they do give that 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 input as well. So that's a document that's available um, to to our members, and and audit committees have um, also have access to those to that document. Um, where they can go out and, and, and really see what some of the profession um, agreed upon solutions are to, um, to some of the common recurring um, inspections findings that have been identified. Over and above that, we also host um, quite a number of, um, of seminars and events where we take, for example, I'll take an example such as um, one of the recurring findings that, that always comes up in the every inspections findings report is around um, the audit of cash flow statements, for example, where 
we'll get a preparer perspective, get an ex expert on that side, as well as get a practitioner um, to come and actually have a discussion just around um, uh, that particular topic. So we do that on a number of topics um, that have been identified and pulled out in the in the in the in the urban inspections report. Um, so we've got those those platforms. Um, there's, there's, also been a, there's been a question, just to, sorry to interrupt, as to where do they find those documents? What are they called? All right, so the document will share the link as well um, via okay. via Vikashni, but it's on the resources page on the on the SICA, um website. Yes. Um, the document is called the Frequently Asked Questions, um, Common Inspections Findings, and Other In Practice Matters. Um, so that's a link that we'll um, we'll share with um, with everyone on this call. Um, so we've got that. Um, but most importantly, I just I, I want to go back to the quality management um, part of it that I spoke around because I think it's quite it's such a fundamental standard. Mm -hmm. um, the standard setter being the International um, Auditing and Assurance Standards Board have revised that's um, the, the the quality management standards. The RBA have adopted it um, or adopted the suite of standards. And I think, or based on our views, I mean, I think it's, it's such a fundamental standard that has the ability to kind of improve quality um, throughout um, throughout the um, um, various aspects within the firm. Um, so as SICA, we have partnered with URBA, we have partners with um, the Pan-African Federation of Accountants, um, where on a monthly basis, we actually unpack all of those standards and really get to understand what some of the implementation challenges are. And all of the, again, all of those resources are also available on our website. So audit committee members also, um, but they, like I said, they're free of charge. They can get access to those documents. If not, you know, reach out to us at SICA through the ACF as well. We are more than willing to kind of share um, those documents. We've also entered into partnership agreements with other institutes across the globe. Um, for example, um, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Australia and New Zealand, where they get to share some of their documents as well um, with us. And we make those freely available to our members. So there's a lot of resources out there. But one thing that we always try to um, to communicate is that you know um, visit our website. Um, we try to create awareness. Just there's so much resources that we've got um, to assist um, everyone involved within the process. Um, so yeah, that's what I would encourage all audit committees members to do, as well as some of our practitioners as well who are not aware. You know, visit that visit our website and interact with us. That, that sounds great. And it's going to obviously renew all the time because you're looking at it constantly. It's not that you've done it and you've left it. It's going to be addressed on an ongoing basis. Tasneem, are there benefits for the audit committee? And, and what should uh, questions should the audit committee be asking in relation to the URBA results? And a third leg to my question, what should external auditors present to ensure that there will be prompt remediation? Thanks, Hester. So I think, you know, and, and I'm fortunate enough to be on some of the audit committees that actually have separate meetings to discuss uh, over inspection reports. And, and it usually takes um, yeah more than an hour or so to, to go through it. So most certainly there are benefits. And as I had indicated earlier, it's it also supports the correlation of all the inputs that we're receiving in our continuous assessment of our auditor suitability. In terms of the questions that we ask, and, and maybe and one of the most important things that we start off actually is assessing and we do question the, the partners in the room and the risk partner, because obviously we do require risk partners to give a view on the reports that have been submitted. But we test what is the tone of the leadership. And it comes through the letters that have been you know, responded to the ERBA and obviously letters to ourselves uh, dealing with the issues or presenting the issues on hand. So what is the tone of the leadership? What is the stance in resolving the issues raised? <clears throat> and that gives us an indication as to how seriously this is taken by the audit firms. And, and that's the first, I guess, um, evidence that, that we look for. Of course, we're not suggesting at all that uh, firms don't have a right to challenge. You know, I, I think it's important that, that they should um, and they must if, if, if deemed necessary. But we do expect them to demonstrate a commitment, a firm commitment to audit quality. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, an important thing that we test and we do challenge, um, you know, the, the firm on. 
I think another important point that we do uh, look at is what is the nature of the thematic issues? And as I said, also, how does that correlate to our experience of the firm and other pieces of information that, you know, that we would have reviewed in relation to the firm and the partner? Um, the other matter is um, what is the root cause of the significant issues? And then more importantly, once we've identified that the firms have demonstrated what is the root cause of significant issues, what are the action plans that the firm have put in place to resolve and by when? Um, you know, I think it's also important for audit committees, to Devon's point, is actually to demonstrate a clear timeline with milestones and report back, I guess, to the audit committees as to how they're achieving these, these milestones. I'm very encouraged uh, that the Urba in their eighth cycle have guided on a proactive monitoring process with audit firms. And in fact, that's something I would look to also bring into, you know, more regular audit engagements with our audit firms, who obviously we meet regularly. So this must be part of their feedback to us if, if that's, that's the case. Um, um, another very important point that we constantly do check in with the firm and the partner is how has the partner of the firm ensured that the issues that we've read and seen and has been raised in prior inspection reports are not prevalent in our audit. For us, that is very, very important and that demonstration and evidence needs, needs to be clear. Um, yeah, um, you asked me another, you asked me a third part. Um, was the third part, I Hester? Sorry. Uh, uh, is it, where, where am I? Um, are there benefits for the audit committee was the other one? No, no, you so said, I think you asked me about uh, whether the, yeah, there are, so there are benefits and that whether they should be, you know, so to ensure prompt remediation. So as I've indicated, I do think it's important that we do have a built-in process. So, you know, we obviously engage with the auditors in private session as well, and that's a good mechanism for them to demonstrate how they've, how they've achieved on their, on their, on their milestones um, to, to, I actually want to just raise um, something else, so I guess beyond what you've just asked me, of course, we've experienced some challenges as audit committees in receiving these urban reports. I mean, we touched on it a little bit earlier that the reports are long. They're definitely longer than they've been before. They are more detailed. They're definitely more granular. And we encourage and welcome that this is a more transparent reporting from Urba. It does, of course, as I've indicated, does play some challenge in us because as audit committees, we now have to uh, consume this information and then objectively reach a conclusion based on multiple inputs. Um, so, you know, if, if I could urge that we do think about how we try and get some type of, um, I'm not sure, materiality or proportionality or context in terms in reporting some of these issues to help guide us in our formulation of our objective view. I think that'll go a long way for audit committees. The other matter is that oftentimes in these very detailed reports, the issue that we face is that we sometimes see old uh, referrals, obviously, that are still open. So obviously, being again a matter of judgment that the audit committee has to opine on, and comfortable with the basis of all the other information that we have, but the fact that they're still open either referrals or investigation, referral for investigation, et cetera, it does place the audit committee in a, in a I guess, somewhat uncomfortable position, but usually, like I said, well supported. So, um, I mean, I would just, with the with our regulator, with the audit regulator here on screen, I would also urge that, you know, there would be a mechanism of expediting long lead times on these referrals. It would just most certainly help the audit committee in reaching their conclusion in a more informed manner. Yeah, th thanks, Tasneem. That's, that's great. Uh, two things. Firstly, um, what I found helps enormously is to get the likes of Devonoy's equivalent to come and talk to the audit committee in meeting. You know, even if you've had the private sessions and all the rest of it, um, if you have key issues in that report, it just it just gives it that uh, it's almost raises the level of understanding of perhaps um, the whole company, not just the audit committee members. So, so that I found is helpful. Um, but then, um, Imre, just to respond to, to Tasneem and also to, to, to just uh, let us, you know, think about it and say, is there opportunity for audit committees and the regulator to collaborate in promoting high audit quality? Just your view around that. Hi, Esther. Thank you. Very important question. 
as you know, um, Erba is a member of EFR, uh, the Independent Forum of Independent uh, International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators. It's about 54 countries, uh, regulators from from independent um, audit regulators from 54 countries, um, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting to see that some of the first world countries we probably tracking behind in terms of collaboration between audit committees and, and audit regulators. Uh, so um, it's something that we, we've we recognized as an area of, of, of growth. But to answer you, yes, definitely. There's definitely room for, for improvement and we take this very serious. I'm actually joined by Ntlambi Gulwa, our director inspections on this call. Um, and I mean, she, she had another session, but I, we just agreed that this is so important that we we need to be here. And I also saw Nadine, our education director. It just, you know, we're really just very serious about how can we build and and leverage of a relationship in the, you know, as best as we can. So I'll mention a few things. So just on the on the report. So when we visit firms that audit public interest entities at least once in three years where we do a firm review. We don't inspect each and every partner. It's just humanly impossible with the capacity that we have. But uh, some of the bigger firms, let's say your, your big six firms, we visit them annually. So, so what we've actually done over the past two, I would say over the past two cycles is to find to design the report in such a way that it makes it easier for the firms, but moreover so easier for the audit committees. So I would go so far as to say to Devon's earlier point that you know some you can have reports that are hundreds of pages long, which incorporates individual partner reports. I don't believe our intention from the beginning was for audit committees to work through each and every report in detail. The idea is to lift out the themes. And that is why in the executive summary part of those annual reports that we, or those inspection reports that we issued to the audit committees annually, we do that for you. We actually lift out the themes at firm and, and file level. And it's, it's always like in a table format and it, it shows the, what is the risk. And that, really that is what we expect audit committees to consider. But, you know, to go into the merits of a finding, I don't, that's really not the role of, of audit committees, nor the firm's role, because we, we follow a, re, a remedial action process with each and every firm and individual auditor um, after the inspection. We have a, a very competent uh, manager, senior manager, that actually analyzed the root cause analysis that the firm must submit to us within 30 days. We analyze it. Um, there's a meeting between the firm and, and, and the partners around those root causes. And uh, you know, if, if the discussion is positive and there's a commitment from the firm and uh, there's a com an agreement on the way forward, we are satisfied that we don't have to do that. It's not in our mandate to, to review root cause analysis of firms, but we, we really just want to be sure as a regulator that the firms understand the findings and that they respond to those findings. So audit committees could ask the firms as well in terms of what were the root causes that you reported to the ERBA and sort of, um, uh, you know, are, how are you going to address those root causes on this particular audit? I also want to say that I don't think it's the role of the audit committee to fix audit quality in general. I think it, it's the role of the audit committee to fix, to ensure high quality on, on the audit of the auditor that they appointed. It's not, a, it's not a broad mandate. It's a mandate on that particular audit. So you have that report, you have the themes that were reported by Erba coupled with all the other information. And it's about striking an, agree, an accord and a deal with the firm uh, to say, okay, tell us what are the root causes that you identified with the Erba uh, in terms of the Erba process and, and how, are we, how are you gonna implement it on this audit? So that at the end of this audit, we can all, smile and say, we are happy that, you know, the issues that you reported on another audit is not going to happen on this audit. Um, when you, when audit committees read the reports, we tend to highlight, you know, if it's where we get worried in terms of the firm's system of, of improvement, the effectiveness of the system of improvement, 
We also call it the firm's remediation process. If there's recurring findings, it means that on a, you know, they knew of the findings before, but now you see it again. And I think those are sort of focus areas, I would say, for an audit committee. And also, I think it's important to note that although there might be many findings, audit is the, an audit regulation and inspection is designed, and the audit standards is designed for weaknesses and deficiencies to be identified through quality reviews. It's built into the standards. It will, there will always be quality issues. Um, however, what, what the more serious ones are the ones that should be looked into, in my view. For example, when there's an investigation, one needs to understand what is the basis of the investigation. And uh, in the absence of an outcome, it's, it's, it's definitely something to discuss with the firm in terms of what were the root causes. Because even on a referral from inspections, okay, if there's a referral from inspections, the firm must immediately do remedial action um, on, on, those on those findings um, and find the root causes. Uh, so there's already that process that we're following with the firms in terms of best practice, uh, if you are core principles. Where it's a bit more serious is where there's a disciplinary hearing. Now that means that the firm disagreed with the in investigation and the, the, it's going to a formal court-like hearing. Those are quite serious because it, it, it tells a story, you know, either everybody got it desperately wrong in terms of an inspection or, um, or the firm doesn't want to accept the fact that they, they, something was wrong. So I would say, you know, looking at the themes, looking at those recurring findings, if, if it's highlighted in the, in, the, in, in the executive summary and looking at those themes and, and, and focusing on what, what's the context behind a referral or an investigation. Uh, th those, I would say, would be at the top of my list if I was an audit committee, and I am an audit committee member. Um, I'm currently chairing the audit committee and finance committee of, of EFR. And I mean, it's the same, it, uh, I have the privilege of actually experiencing it as an audit committee member myself. Mm -hmm. so, so really, uh, those key high-level elements, are, I, I would say, would be, would be the things to focus on with the firms. Um, I also want to say we issue the public inspections report, which is our general report. Devon, I saw you, you, you posted something absolutely right. We want to leverage of the experience of those inspections that we did do by issuing a public report that any firm or anybody can pull and analyze. And again, in our public inspections report, we aim to highlight the themes and we aim to also highlight good practices. And I think that the profession has called for that a couple of years ago to say, you report always negatively, um, you know, but where you saw something that worked, why don't you share that with us? And I think we've been sharing success factors, uh, you know, in the last two, three, even four years, I would say we've tried to, to bring those in because there's a learning element as well in terms of the public inspections report. How can we work together? Um, I did say we can definitely work closer together. Uh, we're behind in terms of other countries. But firstly, um, as a regulator, what we can do is to promote transparency, both from the regulator by opening up our inspection um, findings, um, but also to promote transparency by the firms. Um, we're busy consulting now, obviously, on transparency reporting, which is not, not yet mandated in the country but it's something that we, we're considering mandating in the country. So, um, we, we're even contemplating um, uh, that inspectors meet with the audit committee chair as part of the inspection, just at the beginning of the inspection, just to get a sense of you know, how the audit went, are there areas of concern, because an inspection is a risk-based approach in itself. An audit is a risk-based approach. Inspection is a risk-based approach quality management that kicks in on the 15th of December for the firms is a risk-based approach. So it's all about, let's focus on where the risks are and, and not get bogged down on, on the smaller things. So, um, so if, I can, if I can make a final comment, um, audit committee chairs, um, if, if, if we're looking at, at finding a way if it's possible to meet with them, even if it's just a half an hour virtual meeting, you know, that, that wouldn't take a lot out of it, but I think there's, there could be huge benefits in it. I believe uh, under correction, I think some other jurisdiction are already doing this. Um, and then um, the audit committee's role in terms of 
And it's all called, called an audit committee for a reason why, right? Uh, even to your profession analogy, um, it's an audit committee. If everything it does to do with auditing, uh, it, it, it should be at, um, at the heart of what the audit committee does. And the JSE is, um, you know, in the process of consulting in terms of of doing away with firm accreditation. And I think the 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 big next step is to say, but you know, that sort of amplifies the role of audit committees in terms of when engaging, when appointing and reappointing auditors. Um, we will de we definitely recognizing the fact that, you know, long ongoing investigations and disciplinary proceedings are disruptive. Um, it's both, you know, it hangs over the auditor's head, it's negative, it, it's, um, it creates fear in the system or uncertainty rather in the system. Uh, I would say when there's an investigation, uh, summarize in one sentence what was the key theme uh, that, that sort of gave rise to the investigation and is it something that the firm is already recognized as in terms of what the root causes are and what are they doing about it. And I think if the firm provides a, an appropriate response to that with evidence that they are addressing it and the commitment that they are addressing it, I think the, firm, the audit committees could take that away um, as um, as, as some level of, of comfort. Lastly, um, I would like to say, as the regulator, we've, I said right at the beginning, we are a, a regulator with a very limited mandate. We have recognized that a lot of the failures that we've seen have been, uh, have been because of decisions and actions and inaction and unethical behavior of the preparers, the management, those people that are running the day-to-day -day businesses, which which uh, the auditors are not part of and not, should not be part of um, because they should be independent. So we've started a consultation process and, and you'll probably, some of you would have seen maybe some of the letters and the surveys that we've issued recently, uh, but we've established a work stream um, to identify gaps in the ecosystem, to reduce risk in the entire ecosystem, not just in the auditing, but in the entire ecosystem uh, and, and, you know, to uplift um, integrity at every step. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's still a fact that uh, to know that in South Africa, accountants are not regulated. And I mean, that just opens up. And because audit auditors are highly regulated, if something goes wrong, the people run to them first. Where were the auditors? <laughs> Is to, to your earlier point. Yeah. But I think it's, we've reached the point of maturity uh, we are en route to maturity where we need to hold everybody in the, in the ecosystem accountable. Auditors play a role, yes, a very important role. Audit committees play a very important role, but management and those accountants and professionals working in the companies that as a fiduciary duty, you know, they need to be reminded of their uh, social compact, uh, their role as, as agents of trust, their role as uh, individuals and professionals charged with a duty, of, a fiduciary duty on behalf of the investors and the shareholders. And I think if we can reestablish the recognition of the role, the importance and the nobility of working in this process, it's a privilege, Devin, to your point, it's a privilege to actually serve the public interest. Not, it's not, not everyone's cut out to do it. And uh, we need to bring back the nobility, not just of the auditor, but everybody audit committee members, audit committees, boards, um, professionals um, that, are, that are preparing financial information. We need to bring back the sense of responsibility and the nobility of those, of those people as professionals, as public servants. Um, thank you. And uh, we're looking forward to working more and more with audit committees, finding more ways and platforms like this to engage. Uh, and we, we're even looking at maybe having an annual debrief with audit committees um, following the release of the inspection report, so we can sit around the table and just uh, talk about audit quality and 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 and, and ensure things uh, are better uh, the next the next year. Thank you, Esther. Thanks, Imre. That was great and 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 a good summing up of everything. I'm going to give the other members just a quick chance before we go to questions to. Um, anything to add or any comments? Let's go, Devin, you're next on my screen. Yeah, thanks, Hester. I think the one thing that I hear audit committees asking, and I think it's the same thing that Tasneem has asked, is, is there a way in the reporting 
and I, you, to, to indicate what are the matters you really need us to work, what are the big things, what are process things. I think that's quite hard to do, but it, that's probably worth taking away, Imre. Imre has given some tips here about even if you only look at the exec summary, even if you only look at the key themes, even if you only, I think that helps. But I do know most audit committees these days are big listed, uh, do significantly more than that. Mm. Um, and, and so that categorization of issues, you know, between prioritize, which, so prioritize you know, in, some, in some way, um, you know, what, what is housekeeping? What are control improvements that the firm must put in place? What are things we actually worried about could mean that this in opinion is wrong? And that's really hard for the regulator to do because the regulator wasn't there at the time. They've just got your audit file with docs and they say, I can't see enough documentation here to support what you did there. Um, so it's a hard ask. It's not an insubstantial ask, but I think Imre, that's the one thing I, I, you know, I constantly get the, you know, the big diligent audit committees who work through absolutely everything kind of saying, help me to figure out what I really must worry about here. Let's keep it as general as that. Uh, Hester would be the one, the one thing that I hear. The 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 second comment I'd make, Hester, is, and I'm going to say it while the regulator's online, so that uh, Tanda Kutle has mentioned the fact that there's a whole new suite of auditing quality management standards that are coming in. They're effective from the, this December. Yes. I just want to give your members a sense of it. Some of you, Hester, I know you're one of them who's had the privilege of serving a, a US a registrant. <laughs> and therefore you understand when I talk about um, what it means to have a, a suite of Sarbanes-Oxley type controls, this, the 404 controls that, you know, that the US registrants require. And um, the ISQM1 suite of standards is nothing short of requiring a full Sarbanes-Oxley implementation of controls in every audit firm. And I want to just give you a sense of it. Mm. Um, please, that, yeah. That's, that's a, how big a job it is. It's, it's a huge one. So mm. when we, you, you're going to get information flowing to you about our system of quality management, I would like to suggest it's not going to come out all perfect to begin with, to give you a flavor. And I'm sure this varies across the firms, but and Imre, I, can't, I don't have the stats directly in front of me, but I think KPMG has identified globally three and a half thousand controls that would need to be implemented to comply with the standard, of which I think in Africa, which I'm responsible for, we've seen 1,500 as being new. Mm. Um, <laughs> so okay, so maybe, it's a new journey that we have to take. It's and, not, and we're going to not be something on that that's going to happen overnight. And I think I saw Tanda Hookley saying to you, ask about where we are in the journey, but I also know our regulator will be telling you where we are in the journey because they're also going to ask that question. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Devin. Scary, but 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 uh, you know that that's what we need to do. Uh, Tante Kushle. Thank you very much, Hester. Um, I think I think on my side, um, probably two two points to raise. I think um, I think what's come out very clear is that let's not look at the public inspections findings report as a document that's you know, that's there to create contention in the profession. Um, I think everyone um, in the process um, has a goal of wanting to see um, high audit quality being maintained. And I'm glad to see that we're having this, um, these conversations, I think, which then leads to my second point of the importance of these types of discussions going forward, where we can get um, the entire financial reporting ecosystem um, just to make sure that we're not hearing voices from a single perspective. Um, but I think once we get in a boxing ring like this, then you know we're able to um, to clarify some issues that um, that 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 do cause confusions um, every now and then when we meet um, in our various silos. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's get into into that boxing ring and let's have a lot more of these discussions. And I think Imre also touched on it at the last one, just around the importance of the positive stories as well. So that we're not just hearing about, you know, um, the, all the negative aspects, but there is a role for the positive aspects as well to be reported in. And I think if I look at the last report, definitely there's a lot, a bit more coming through um, in terms of the positive stories and how, you know, how 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 auditors are doing things right. If I put it like that, but yeah, a lot more of these discussions are definitely needed. Mm. Tasneem. <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks, Hesta. I mean, I think I raised the two points. So one being, and I hear you, uh, Devin, it might be a difficult ask or a difficult challenge to put to the regulator. I mean, I must say, Imre, I'm very much still of the old days when the elbow inspection report used to come out of the SAT or an unsat, and it was much easier to navigate. Obviously, I am, and I completely understand where we are now in our reporting and transparent of you know information and the and the context that comes through. So I, I'm I'm not at all suggesting we move back to to that. But yeah, it may be useful for us to all reflect. And it can come through through your engagements, as you've indicated, with the uh, with the audit committees and the audit committee chairs, I guess, just to think about how what we're looking for and how we, I suppose, give our final judgment and objective view at the end of these reports. One of the things I just want to raise is, is actually collaboration. I'm very heartened to hear about your thoughts um, on, on that. Um, I was reflecting while you were talking because I hadn't, I wasn't aware that that was the sort of thinking, you know, engagement one on one. It is a useful mechanism. Obviously, we all need to remember what lane we are in, and we all got, you know, have to remember that we still have to be independent, unbiased, and objective in our own lanes. But I think it would be, it would, it would prove to be useful. And I think a final point is what's really useful is having you engage in a forum such as this. Because today, the things that you've actually clarified, I can tell you now, a lot of audit committee members probably don't have that context about going through like line for line in detail, you know, reading a 100 page odd report and expecting an answer on page 85 point, you know, uh, Roman four or whatever it is. So and that's exactly a point. And if we hear it directly from the regulator regulator's mouth. I think it just gives us all that level of confidence that what we're doing, how we're approaching it in looking at high-level thematic issues is the right thing to do. So I think this is very useful engagement for, for all of us. Thanks. I, I agree. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. I, I, I think in my mind, this has cleared up such a lot of issues. We should have done this a year ago, but we've started. So it's something we need to consider going on with. But let's look at the questions. Now, uh, Zibuzi Kuneni is asking, under what circumstances will a client request the regulator to audit the auditors who audited them? Uh, interesting question. Imre, would that ever happen? Is it possible? Yes, there. Um... Or do you or do you not understand the question? Shall we yeah, ask? I, I, shall we ask I them to it, come yeah. online and explain what they want to hear? Yes, please. Oh, he said no. It's a mistake. I'm sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. Then we've got uh, Bafana Elias uh, Makwanazi. Uh, it would be interesting to get a view on the public sector audit committees, especially at local government level. Um, is it possible to give it to answer that one? Because Imre, you don't you don't do audits of the public sector at all, do you? Yeah, so I, I would I would reserve any comments there because we don't we don't regulate the auditor general or anything like that, uh, yeah. uh, especially not municipalities. Okay. Yeah, so 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 unfortunately, uh, I think we'd all be interested in the outcome, but but I don't think uh, this it's probably not the right forum in the first place. But but uh, we wouldn't be able to give you an answer there. Let's see, uh, Vicky, were there any in the in the 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 were there any hands raised, or are there any in the chat? Isn't any hands raised at the moment? If anyone does have a question they'd like to ask live, you're welcome to raise your hand. Um, and there isn't much on in the chat room either. Um, there is a question around need to address the contribution of continuous auditing timing fees and varying quality of, of urban issue reports. I'm not quite sure uh, if that's a question, if it's just a comment. Okay. There isn't any other so questions in the Q&A. And I see that Len, Len Cohn has got his hand raised. Uh, Len, I'm going to allow you to unmute. And you can ask a question. Chair, thanks very much for the engagement. I'm the recently appointed chair of the Financial Reporting 
Standards Council. So earlier mention was made of PAFA and the engagements that are taking place. I have been an auditor like Devon, heavily bruised as a result of uh, being a participant. And over the last 30 years, by way of background, I've served on at least 100 audit committees. I must have chaired, uh, chaired at least 50 listed in New York, London, uh, Europe, South Africa. Uh, so I've been around the block. And what I need to share, and currently I do work in the public finance management, as well as the municipal finance management space, as well as uh, JSE listed entities. A couple of observations. I think audit quality indicators, when Bernard Agullis was present and a seminar was presented at KPMG, which Imre attended, I offered my experience being a professor of accounting and auditing to Bernard, who is now a member of the Financial Reporting Standards. Regrettably, that was not taken up. But I was appointed, and I want to share the experience, by one of the New York-based uh, uh, financial institutions, one of the top five or the top 10 in the world, to join and chair their risk committee. And the engagement there uh, Hester was that it would be a 50 week assignment because this financial institution had operations in 150 different countries. So the point that I'm raising is when I see the complexity of business, for example, Deloitte are the auditors of Glencore and they've sent a partner to Zug in Switzerland to be engaged on a full time basis on coordinating the audit effort of Deloitte's and the various subsidiaries. So the first point that I'm making is that one could look at audit quality indicators. And what I'm looking for uh, going into the future where I chair audit committees and participate thereon is the extent of continuous auditing. So there's an awareness, the instructions that are coming from head office, their quality controls that they have implemented because to get an audit done and the results published as is required by the JSE within three months and to get the glossies out a couple of months later. I think sometimes for the complexity of the types of businesses that we are seeing is certainly uh, extremely onerous and sometimes not doable. So the first issue is continuous auditing where the groups are of a sufficient size and complexity. And when Erba does its inspection reports on what remains of 316 companies on the JSE, there may be a significant number that would qualify. The second issue is that really irks me. And this is the issue, Hester, that relates to audit fees and the pushback and the trimming of audit fees by audit committees. I really want to, uh, to achieve, Devon, what I call a quality audit. And if I want a quality audit, I want to engage, I want to have deep dives on IFRA 17, which is you know, being implemented soon. And I chair an audit committee that has got, has made significant investment. So the fees side, I think we all need to appreciate and uh, propagate the view that, you know, cutting back on fees, if we want a quality audit, we are not going to get there. The third is uh, the issues of reportable irregularity. And I see within the uh, public uh, sector where I chair a number of audit committees, the intensity, the haste, the seriousness with which the Auditor General and their representatives pick up the issue of material irregularity and what is referred to as consequence management. I am mindful of the steps that Herb has taken as far as uh, promoting you know, a harsher regime when it comes to an oversight as far as this is concerned. And then fourthly, Esther, I am a professor at the Graduate School of Business locally. And I have students that are distinction students. I have students that are A, A plus, B, C, D, and I also have failed students. So the quality of the Erba report that I see and that I wish to engage on is that there's a process within the audit firms of continuous improvement. So I might find in one year, and I came across one of the top 10 firms where they audit quality indicators in the Erba report was found wanting. And I sat on an audit committee and we put it to them that these are the steps that we want 
addressed and it needs to be done within the next 18 months or so. So we needed comfort and they needed to find another firm that would come in and have a look at the work that Erba had reported on to give us comfort. So I think what Imre and the team are doing is commendable. You cannot legislate against fraud and dishonesty. You are going to find what we call outliers, but we've got to be sufficiently vigilant that we do address that. We also need to uh, address the issue of audit expectations gap. When I see the press, particularly Anne Crotty, wanting to put the auditors as well as the audit committees of uh, VBS, of Steinoff, of Tongat, Hewlett and Jail, it really saddens me that there isn't an understanding that despite the best intention in the world, the robustness, the engagement that takes place from audit committee members, that if you've got collusion and dishonesty with the best will in the world, you're not gonna address it. So Chair Hester, thank you for indulging me. And I really think we need to go back and look at the aspects of continuous auditing, the extent of fees and the continuous improvement on the AQIs and uh, bringing to attention ongoing training and education as far as audit committee members are concerned, not only on standards of IFRS, uh, but uh, audit standards as well that Imran Vanker posts on a regular basis. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you for your comments. And uh, I have to say that we could have a whole webinar on all those issues, but uh, they make they make imminent sense. Any comments any that anyone wants to make uh, in response to Lynn's uh, issues? They're all real issues for us. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Lynn. Thanks for contributing. And um, perhaps Saika can take note um there's some guidance we probably need on some of those uh so so when they're discussing what they look at next maybe and even the audit committee forum can consider some of the issues and and look at them going forward then um there was a question around why does the auditor general not files not reviewed but that's i, I think it's it's outside the ambit of of this um this th this webinar and there's another question. Can a private company ask Uber to audit the auditors specifically, or is it just as on a sample basis? Im Imra, I'm going to ask you to answer. I, I have thoughts, but I don't know the truth. So. Thank you, Esther. First of all, Urba, we, we, we only perform risk-based inspections, but if a company um, and if I understand the question correctly, it says, uh, can a private company ask Erba to, to, I would say, I would rather say, uh, uh, inspect the auditors specifically to their company. So I think um, this is, this is a, 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 an important question because you need to, like Tasneem said previously, stay in your lane. So if you say company, does it mean management? Who is it? The directors? Is it the board? Is it the audit committees? Um, I think if uh, if it's management, the first point of call obviously would be the audit committee to say we have concerns about the auditor um, and and that to relay that to the audit committee because the audit committee has a as in the company's act a role to play in terms of 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 the appointment and the reappointment of of the auditors. If the audit committee feels that you know there's a problem with the auditors, they should uh, obviously assess whether they want to retain the, the auditor or not. I think uh, the ERBA only becomes involved where, where um, if there's a complaint, obviously it, it could trigger an investigation and there's a formal process of that. But if there's concerns around quality, I would say it's best to, to channel that through the audit committee but if it's the audit committee that has a concern to uh, sort of consider that in terms of the appointment of the auditor, and if, the, if uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that an audit committee would report the auditors that they appointed to, to the to, to, to ERBA to inspect. However, I've, it's not something that we've seen before, but if anybody has a concern around an audit firm, uh, and there's a tip off to the regulator. We do have a business intelligence process whereby we look at those tip offs um, 
because we follow a risk-based approach. If we believe it's something worth looking into, we will uh, scope it in um, in terms of our inspections. Uh, but yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and I hope I I gave a technically correct answer. <laughs> Any other comments on that? Tasneem, not. I'm I'm good. Thanks. Okay, uh, I don't see any other. Uh, sorry, Vicky, I didn't. I didn't close off the one properly. I thought it was more of a comment than a question, and I should have said that. So I apologise for that. There, there are no other open questions. Um, no, there isn't anything else that I'm seeing. All right. Well, then I would firstly like to thank the panelists and for all the work that they've done and put into the thinking they've done to. Uh, uh, be here today and and give us really good insights into this whole process so thanks for them and then in particular thanks to everybody who joined the webinar and uh, i'll then leave it to vicky as to how people can get hold of us if there are questions that weren't answered so thanks again everybody and uh, i look forward to another one of these in the future vicky Thank you, Hester, Imre, Tasneem, Devon, um, and Tandukole. Um, it was a pleasure to have you guys on board the session. I think everybody shared some very useful insights um, and comments and um, things, I think, for everybody in the audience to take back and consider. Um, Cindy will send an email to all the attendees um, with a recording of the session as well with a link. So you're welcome to share this um, with the rest of your colleagues. And if there are any questions, you're more than welcome to email us and we will point it to the right in the right direction. And if we can answer, we'll try and send you a written response. So you're more than welcome to get in touch. Um, from the audit committee side, I think Devin, Hester and the rest of the team, I mean, we'll consider what was raised here and some of the discussions and see how else as the as the forum we can put out, you know, further guidance or FAQs to, you know, help order committees, you know, navigate um, these items. But thank you for joining us. And I think this is the last forum event for the year. So I wish everyone a very lovely, festive and prosperous new year. And we'll see everyone back again in 2023.